Hey, welcome back to Woodworking with Wes. It's Saturday and we're not in the garage today, we're in the shop. But I have a story to tell you. My wife loves the furniture that Pottery Barn has. The one thing about the Pottery Barn furniture is I can't afford it. It's nice furniture and so we found the one that she liked and we're going to dupe it and make a great piece of furniture. Let's grab our tools and get started. We're getting ready now to cut out the pieces to make the box portion of our cabinet. The cabinet that was on a pottery barn was made out of solid wood. We're going to be using domestic sheet goods that we can purchase that are easily attainable. We're using alder and we're going to build the whole cabinet out of alder. This is alder plywood. It has a ply core and a veneer so that it has a nice surface and that's going to come into play when we do our finish. You could also use complete solid wood if you wanted to use some sort of domestic wood like alder and glue up your solid woods you could do that too but I like to use sheet goods. It's a little more expensive and we'll talk about the costs as we go along so that you're brought up to date on how much this cabinet is going to cost and how much you can save. But first off let's get started cutting up our sheet goods. we have our box pieces cut out. These are our sides. We're 16 inches deep and 31 and a half inches tall. The actual overall height when we get all done is going to be 36 inches. So keep that in mind as we go through because there's going to be a foot on and there's a top piece. Our cabinet itself 31 and a half. So here's our sides. These two strips here will be the stretcher pieces that go at the top of the side that we'll anchor our top to. So these will be nailed in and then we'll put screws through to anchor our solid wood top and we'll build the solid wood top almost last. So there's that. And then these, this is the bottom to the inside of the bottom of the cabinet and the inside shelf to the cabinet. It will have one shelf in the middle and the bottom and it's just a fixed shelf. It's not adjustable so it's just in the middle of it. We're going to go ahead and sand all these pieces on the interior before we begin to assemble so that we can have it all finished on the inside. The inside of this cabinet is going to be just clear finish and then the outside has a really cool stain and glaze finish. You'll be amazed to see that and it's really amazing when you put it on alder. It's fun to watch. We'll get to that. We're getting ready now to assemble the box portion of our cabinet. I did make one change and I want to point that out. If you'll notice on our sheet goods we have a plywood edge. And I didn't want a plywood edge on our mid shelf. And so I added a quarter inch strip of solid wood, sanded it down, and then recut our mid shelf to the dimension that we had started off with, the 16 inches. So these are 16 inches deep. Our side, our shelves, our bottom are all 16 inches deep. So like I say, now we're getting ready to do it. We have our side pieces here now. The first thing we're going to be doing is putting a cleat. So we're going to add this cleat to the bottom and this is going to be the support for the bottom of our cabinet. So our bottom is going to sit right here and nail into the side pieces. So the first thing, like I say, we're going to put the cleat on with just a little glue. And a cleat is basically a spacer support. So when I say cleat, spacer support. And we're just going to use inch and a quarter, 18 gauge brads, and a little glue. And nail and glue them across here. I like to put cleats and things like that on my bottom of my pieces like this whenever I possibly can because of the consistency that it gives me to my bottom shelf. It just is a way to make sure that my measurement is correct, a way to make sure that I have plenty of support. Okay, there we are. So here's a side, and here's a side like this, and let's slide the bottom in there so you can see how that works. So 
Here's our bottom shelf. We'll put this down out of the way. And our bottom shelf fits against our cleat and creates that extra support and measurement that we're after. We'll make a couple of nails from the outside and even one or two down from the top just to get, make this a really good, strong, square joint. Like that. We're now getting ready to nail in the top stretchers that will be our hanging cleat again for our top when we get ready to put it on. It's just nailed from the side. It's flush with, this is the back of the cabinet or the front, depending on which we're doing, but we're flush to the top of it and we're flush to the edge. And we're just going to give it three nails like that and we'll do that the rest of the round around. There's one piece at the top here and another piece at the bottom and that will create our hanging cleat for our top. With our top cleats nailed in and our bottom nailed in, we're getting ready now to put our mid shelf in. Our mid shelf will fit in like this and be nailed from both sides. Now. For measurement, we're going to be measured up 12 inches, so I made my shelf a 12 inch spacer jig. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know I love spacer jigs because it makes my measurement so easy and it holds my shelves nice and square. It basically is just a piece of quarter inch material, scrap, with a little board nailed onto it, any kind of a scrap piece nailed onto it that makes it square. And you just hang that over the edge of your box, push it down. And it creates a little spacer and holds your shelf straight. And I just love spacer jigs. I make them for my cabinets all the time. And I would have boxes full of these things when I was building cabinets for a living, kitchen cabinets for a living. And I, whenever I needed a spacer jig, I had them. And you can take your little spacer jig once you get your first one nailed in there. Take your spacer jig, turn it around, and use that as an indicator line where you put your nails in to make sure they go into your shelf. So now you know why I use so many spacer jigs. We'll go ahead and get this shelf nailed in. We have our cabinet laying on its side. This is the face of the cabinet. This is the bottom. This is the top. On our piece that we're replicating, it has a paneled end, and we're going to do the same thing by applying these strips in a paneled effect. Now, we've done this on other cabinets before, and so this is not something that is unusual for us to do. We're just going to create a panel like this, and the extension on our strips will create a foot. And I'll show you how we get that all when we get to, to that point. I'll show you how we're going to put a little block underneath there and make that a good, strong, uh, reinforced foot for our end panel and our face frame. But right now, the first thing we have to do is we have to sand our panel because we won't be able to sand it afterwards. We've puttied the holes that will show. There's some holes around the edges. They're mostly covered, but there's a few. We'll sand this. We've taken a little block sander and we've sanded the edge of our strips so they'll all be sanded. And then after we nail them on, we'll putty up and we'll sand it all together at the end. So first off, sand. We'll take our blower and blow off our sawdust. We're going to be using a headless 23 gauge pin gun with a little bit longer inch and an eighth pins. This strip here is bigger than the back strip. The reason being is once we apply the face frame here, this will be the same size as this so that it makes a nice corner. But let's get started by putting this piece on. We'll run a bead of glue down here. Doesn't need to be a lot, just needs to be enough to hold that strip good and solid while we nail it on. Let's see, make sure we get our sanded edge that we just did to the inside flush with the top and flush with the face of our cabinet. And we're kind of sliding around on our glue. 
So there we go. Okay. Go. Okay, now our top piece. Again, making sure that we've got our sanded edge to the middle. So right there like that, okay. We're gonna give a little glue here to on the joint and cross the top. Now I just made these pieces by resawing some of my thicker alder that I'll be using for my uh, countertop for the top of it and I had some extra so I ripped them in and re-saw. Re-saw is when you split a thicker piece of wood into thin and so I have some saw blade marks but I'm turning my saw blade marks to the outside and when I sand it all they'll all be gone. Okay a little more glue down here. One of the reasons that I'm putting on the top and bottom rail before I put the other, before I put this last style on the outside is the style on the outside here on the back this is the back of the cabinet remember the back of the cabinet the style creates a little dado for our back to be nailed into so that our back will be behind this piece of wood also. Okay. This will go like this. And now there's a little lip over here and our back will fit in there. You'll see when we get ready to put our back on how that really works. And it just is such a an easy way to make a little dado for our quarter inch back. And there we've created our panel. We'll go through and putty the holes now and then like I say we'll sand this all at once and we'll be doing the same thing to the other side. Okay, with our glue and our putty now dry, we'll sand 80 grit, 120 and 150 for final sand. Some 150 grit sandpaper to break the sharp edges of the inside of our panel, like that, and then 150. All right. Same thing on the other side. We have our side panels all done and sanded now. Now we're getting ready to make the face frame. Now we're going to use our side panel as a, a kind of a pattern as to what the thicknesses of our face frame. This will be the front rail to our face frame and it's the same width as our back rail to our panel. When we put this on, I, we create the same measurement as we have here so it makes a nice square corner. So this is going to be our styles for our face frame. Our rails are the same thickness as our top and bottom rail on our end panel and will go between the two styles. So that's the next thing. Make face frame, put it on. With our face frame now all put together, we're going to glue and face nail the face frame 
and then putty and sand. So let's set this off. And we'll run a bead of glue around our face of our cabinet. Okay, there we are. Put our face frame on, make it flush with the bottom of our cabinet. And then I always step to the side like this and make sure that we're centered. Put one tack on there. One in the middle. And then I always like to turn the cabinet around and make sure that I'm also centered along the top before I finish nailing. And we're good right there. So let's just go for it. We'll be puttying and sanding all of this so our face nails will all be covered and when we put our finish on that I'm telling you about, you won't see any of the face nails. With our face frame glue and putty drying, we're gonna go ahead and glue up the top to our buffet. I have milled my wood, cut it to length. I'm using an inch and a half thick solid alder, so we're gonna have a real chunky solid wood top. And we're just going to glue it together and clamp it and let it dry good, really good, while we finish up on some of the other stuff. Before we go any further though, ha, ah, look at that. Okay, plenty of glue in this glue joint because we're gluing up inch and a half. So we're gonna make sure we got plenty of glue. We're not going to be using biscuits or, or anything like that. We're just going to glue with just glue and clamp and that will be plenty of strength for the top of our buffet. I have it already ripped, these pieces are already ripped to the width that I want to have, but I'm a little extra long so that I can trim the odd ends once it's all dry. Okay, and in order to keep, we want to make sure we're as flat as we possibly can be so that we make our sanding minimal. That piece keeps wanting to come up. There, let's hold that down. All right, there we go. And then we always, always clamp from both sides. Making sure our seams are as flat as possible. There we go, and we've got good squeeze out. You can see that we've got plenty of glue, so we've got good squeeze out on all of our seams. And we're good and smooth across the end of our seams. Now we'll just go back and give it one little half twist everywhere. All right, we'll let that dry, and we'll go back and now, and finish sanding out our face frame. I just thought I'd bring you up to date on some of the cost of what we're doing. Now that I have my top glued together and all of my hardwood on my cabinet, I figured it out based upon the hardwood cost that I paid, I'm $60 in my alder. Now I bought clear alder, premium stock, so I paid a little extra money for the really good stuff, but I'm still only $60 in my hardwood. Now that we have our buffet all sanded out, we're waiting for the top to still have some additional drying time. And I wanna go ahead and get started on the doors. We cut a piece of our veneer stock for our doors. I'm 
cut some edge banding that I'm going to put on. I made my edge banding 3 eighths of an inch thick and our edge banding is 13, thick, 13 sixteenths wide. Our panel is 3 quarters of an inch thick so when we nail this on that will give us some sanding to do to both sides to bring them down flush. I'm going to nail one piece on the top and one piece on the bottom and then I'm going to cut my doors and then go back and nail my side pieces full length all the way up on both of my new doors. And I've labeled them, or not labeled them, but I've made a, 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 just an X on here so that I can keep my uh, veneer pieces coming together so it's a book match like I want. So we're going to go ahead now and just get everything nailed on and I'll putty the doors and ready for sand when we get done with that. So let's uh, move our cabinet out of the way. Nail on our first two pieces of edge banding. We're just going to use our 23 gauge headless pin gun. I made some marks here. This is the mill end. We're going to cut that away. But this is the edge that I cut on my table saw. And so I want that edge to be a good edge. So when we nail our edge banding on, I'm going to nail in just a little bit from here so we can run this against the fence. We'll make our cuts from there. So uh, glue. We'll stand it up like this. Make sure we're clean. Run us a bead of glue all the way down the top like that. And then we'll just nail our edge banding on. And we'll just make sure by holding it, we'll make sure that we're centering it over the top of our veneer stock. Like that. and come the other way. By doing it this way, I've now put the top and bottom on both doors all at once by just nailing on two pieces. So this is just a, a time-saving way to do this. Also, when you cut your door width, your edge bending is already cut perfect. Okay, just like that. We'll give that just a second to, uh, to dry and then we'll cut our door sizes. We have now cut our doors to size. We did our banding across the top. Now we've done our banding on both sides. So all that needs to be finished off on these doors is to be sanded. We'll putty these seams. We'll putty the little nail holes that we put in, the little pins. But these are just almost all ready to go. That's, they are a very simple little door out of our plywood. Now, we have completed the amount of plywood that we were using, the veneer stock that we're using. Now remember, I bought some very expensive veneer stock. You can buy less expensive veneer stock by getting a particle board core or an MDF core but I bought the most expensive because I will be using some of it for other places in a job that I'm doing. Now, one of the things that I want to explain is that by, if you want to glue your stock together, it's cheaper. This was a little more expensive and we spent over $150 for this particular sheet of plywood, but we were able to build the entire cabinet with some leftovers out of one sheet. So we've, we're $150 in our plywood. We'll go back and tally it all up when we get done. These are our doors that we worked on and we have them all banded and sanded. Now I wanted to show you a little trick on sanding. Now this is the back side of the door here. We've already sanded the front side. Remember I told you that the edge bending that we put on was a little wider than the thickness of our plywood. This is a veneer plywood, and so we want to sand this hardwood down flush with the veneer, but we don't want to sand through the veneer. Veneer's not very thick. Now, I have a 100 grit sandpaper on here, but I'm using an old one that is not quite as, 
as coarse as a brand new pad. And I'm going to go through and I've puttied my seam all the way around. I do that also to fill, but I do it also as an indicator of when I have sanded enough. And let me just show you this little trick. I've showed it on other videos, but if you haven't seen, let me just show you this little trick. It'll save you ever sanding through veneer. <laughs> I sand down to where the, the putty line is almost completely gone. And I know that when that putty line disappears, I'm down flush with the veneer. So if I watch myself real close and sand my hardwood edge down to where my putty line disappears, I'm not sanding through my veneer. Now I'll sand the rest of the way around with my 100 grit. Then I'll come back and I'll just lightly sand over again with my 120 and then finish off with my 150 making sure that every last little bit of that putty line has disappeared. But by doing it in stages and being very careful, I don't ever sand through my veneer. And at the cost of veneer sheets nowadays, this is something you want to make sure you don't do. At the beginning, we talked about we were going to be gluing some blocks in to give our feet some additional support. These are the blocks that I was talking about. They've been put in now and sanded. So let's stand our buffet up on its feet. And now we have a good solid base on those. And this cabinet is now ready for stain. And our top, I want to talk about our top. We glued our top up. After it dried, I took it out of clamps, I sized it to the size I wanted, and then I spent my time sanding it down. Now, I want you to know that it took a little bit of time sanding it down. I want to show you something. This is all the sandpaper that I used to get it sanded down. It took a little time to work down the seams. Some of them were not as even as they could have been. I did it all with a palm sander, and I just spent my time working the seams and getting it all smoothed out. And now I have a beautiful top ready for stain. And that's our next step. Let's get staining. We're using Sherwood Wiping Stain for our stain. And we've had it tinted to a color called uh, Simply White. Now Simply White is a Minwax color. We've used this stain before on a couple of our cabinets and we really like it. But we're going to do something special today to make it look totally different. So watch as we go through with our staining process all the way through because you'll be amazed how it ends up. But first thing we'll do is get a coat of stain on. Now, we're not going to be staining the back side of the doors because the inside of our cabinet is just going to be a clear finish. So the inside of our door will also be just a clear finish. I always start with my edges. And we just put some stain on the edges and Wipe it down so that it's smooth. Come back, other side. You can see how this white stain just really puts a nice light color on this alder. Now we'll stain the face of our door. I always like to apply my stain in a circular motion, driving it down into the grain so that it gets a good stain into the wood. On this particular stain, we want to make sure we have plenty of stain because when I make the final little part of this, you'll see what happens. Okay. Now we'll smooth that out a little bit. And then when we take our paper towel to wipe it off, we're going to just smooth it out. We're not going to take all that stain off. We're just going to straighten it up. Okay, there we are. 
Let's go ahead and stain our top. Okay, that final part where we straighten out that stain so that it really kind of highlights that grain but keeps that color that we're after. Okay, we're going to go ahead and finish staining the cabinet and then we'll get ready for the extra special part that comes after. We know that many of you have the ability to spray your finishes and so that's what we're going to do today. We've got, already got our stain on. It's dried, the recommended one hour. We're going to put a sealer coat on it and then watch what we do after that. Okay, we have put a sealer coat. I went ahead and glazed the edges. We're using Pro Coat, it's called medium brown. So we're just going to use some glaze on here. And the way we are applying the glaze is the thing that really makes this unique. Typically, we wipe a glaze or we put a glaze on and we wipe it off as much as we can and just leave a little bit in the profiles or whatever. But this glaze, we want this glaze to have a little bit of a, of a rustic look to it. Not really a true rustic, but just a, um, uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but it has a little bit of a rustic appeal to it. And the way we do it is we smooth our glaze out. And then after we've got the most of the glaze off, I get myself a fresh piece of or space on my paper towel clean up my edges, and then make sure you go all the way across. And it kind of creates some lines, but it's not really truly a, like a grain line. It's just, or a, or a rustic, well, I don't know how to, to describe it. But anyway, that's the look we're after. Let's just do it again so you can watch the process again. but it gives it a real warm finish that is not really a true stain or a paint, but it just has kind of a, a nice warm feel to it. I really like it. This is very similar to what we saw at Potter, Pottery Barn. This is my version of it, I guess I should say. Straighten out those lines. And the secret to this that I can see is don't lift up your paper towel halfway through or your rag or whatever you're using. Make sure that you carry it all the way across so that there's a nice even feel to it all the way across. Okay. Maybe we could call that a little bit of a, a faux look, a faux graining look. 
Ooh, I like that. Okay, now let's do one of the panels on the side of the cabinet and see how that comes out. We're getting ready to do our end panel. Now typically when I do a door, I do the frame first and the panel very last because that's where I hang on to it. Being as that this is on a cabinet, I'm going to reverse that process and I'm going to do my panel first and then do my style and rail. And part of the reason I'm going to do that is because I want to make sure I get my, my nice smooth look on my panel. And if it spills over a little bit on the style and rail, I can solve that and, and take care of that at the very end when I'm just doing the style and rail. Okay, let's get a pl plenty of glaze in there. I love this glaze. This Pro Coat glaze, just so nice to work with. We spent a lot of time learning about different kinds of glaze, trying to find the one that was the best. And this is the one that I just you know, really would recommend above all the ones that we tried and all the ones that we found. This is just such a nice glaze. Remember to check on our description. Procoat has offered a little incentive to purchase from them. All right, let's. Make sure you get in all the corners so you don't have any bare spots. Now we'll go back with a cleaner paper towel. We are going to highlight the profile here by having a little glaze stick in the corner like we typically would on any other paneled door. Now, unlike the door, we were able to go off of the edge of the door and do an end on our panel, on the interior of our panel. What we're going to have to do is start at the top and just kind of feather out to the middle like that and then start at the bottom and feather up to the middle on the bottom like that in order to create the same effect that we had on our door. Oh yeah, that, need a little extra over here. We've got a little bit of a white streak. We don't want a white streak, no. Let's get that solved. That's the nice part about this glaze. You can just keep working it until you get exactly what you want. And there. Not as easy to do the panel as the door, but it's going to look great. Okay. Now we'll go back and do the style and rail set, or the style and rail portion of the end panel. And I think we'll do that one at a time. Like that. Be careful that we don't get any of our paper towel down here and put lines in our panel that we just finished. Okay, there's that. Same thing down at the bottom. style, top to bottom, okay. little 
light. Need a little more color in this one. There we go. That's what I'm after. We'll do the same thing on the back one and then we'll go ahead and finish up the rest of the way around the cabinet. Our glaze has dried and we sprayed their final coat of finish on. We used a pre-catalyzed flat lacquer, flat sheen lacquer. And so we're going to go ahead now and proceed with our final assembly. We'll nail the back on first and then get doors hinged and put on and put on our top. There's our clear finish interior, ready to go. All right, now we're gonna put this out of the way. Our doors are going to have, we went to our hardware store and we bought some hinges. If we can get the package open here, there we go. We bought some no mortise hinges. Our no mortise hinges are going to fit like this on the side of the door. And we bought some bar poles that will go up here or here, depending upon where it goes. So if the hinge is over here on this side of the door, our bar pole is going to be like this, and that will be our hardware. So let's get started by putting the hinges on and then mounting the hinges on the cabinet or the doors on the cabinet, and then we'll install our handles. We're getting ready to install our hardware. We'll do hinges first. While I was sanding my door, I went around and in the back of the upper outside corner, I marked a little X in ink on each of my doors. So there's one over here and one over here that held my doors so that I knew what was in and out and top and bottom. So we're going to go ahead and mount our hinges on here. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to come two inches, actually two and a half inches down and two and a half inches up on my door. And that is where I'm going to position my hinge. Now my hinge, there's my little two and a half inch mark. I'll put it right there. I'm going to use my VEX bit. Now let's talk about the VEX bit here. The VEX bit is a centering bit. When you put it in a screw hole and push a small drill bit comes out and drills you a pilot hole for your screw and it centers it automatically and so we're going to use our VEX bit, our centering bit, to get our holes started for our hinges. We're going to just use the, now the way, a, a, the way that a uh, non-mortise hinge works, you have two plates. One folds inside of the other. One plate screws to the door. One plate screws to the door jam or to the, the face frame in this case. And then they fold into each other and creating only this thickness so that you don't have to mortise in a, a hinge an old typical butterfly hinge would have to be mortised because you had two thicknesses of metal coming together. 
This way you have two thicknesses of metal that fold into each other and create uh, what they call on a non-mortise hinge. I really like non-mortise hinges because you don't have to go to all the time and effort of mortising. And uh, so let's take our VEX bit and we'll mark And you can see, you can see how my VEX bit has centered the holes for my hinge. Works really cool. And we'll do the same thing now on our face frame of our cabinet. When we've marked the positioning places for that, we'll place our hinge up here and we'll take our VEX bit and we'll drill the two holes corresponding to the hinge where they go. But let's go ahead and get a hinge, a couple of hinges mounted. We keep turning this door around the wrong way. And okay, so this is the front of my door and piloting bit has helped us put our hinges in the right place and our screws go in nice and easy. And there's our non-mortise hinge screwed to the door and this part will screw to the cabinet. That's how that works. We'll go ahead and get those all mounted and get our door set up. This is the handle that we've chosen, just a bar pull. I'll show you how we're going to install it. We made a little jig to line our holes up. Our jig fits over the top of our door and lines up with the edge of our door. We use the same jig on this side over here and so we're just going to do the same thing here. Okay. And there's our holes, and we'll put our screws, our bolts in. Here's our bar pull. And there's our handles lined up and equally spaced. Well, here we are at the end of our buffet cabinet. It has a real modern look, but kind of a rustic feel to it with the finish that we put on. Turned out really nice. Now we talked about giving you the prices. As we went along, we told you how much our hardwood was costing, how much our plywood was costing, our, our veneer goods we were using. And now that we've put a finish on and added some hardware, We've got this for less than $300. That's one third the price that we saw the original for when we were looking it up online. Neat little cabinet and you can build one just like it. Saturdays in the shop with Wes are great. And we'll see you next time on Woodworking with Wes.